um, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. It's uh, really exciting. I live in Toronto, so it's uh, pretty good night, but it's always great to kind of see the whole uh, the whole RFA crew. Um, yeah, this course is really great, so thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm just I'm going to talk a little bit about starting uh, RFA and new practice, specifically if you're in a hospital or associated with a hospital slash university, and um, I'll go through it a little bit. A lot of what I'm going to talk about actually has already been spoken about, so I'll try to skip through that stuff. Um, uh, and uh, and if you have any questions while I'm talking, stop me. I'm, I've, I'm not really uh, kind of set to a, um, a specific time frame or whatever, so if you want to ask questions in the middle, please go ahead and uh, we'll just fill them out. So uh, I don't have any relative disclosures. Um, I will talk about um, a few things. One is getting started uh, in any new scenario. I think it's really um, a bit daunting to uh, start something when no one else is doing it. Um, I had this experience with a couple things in my uh, area in Toronto. Um, in Canada, we have a little bit of a different incentive scenario for surgeons and for procedurists, um, where starting new things is a little bit more difficult because uh, we don't have that kind of innovative drive for um, the, uh, the market. Uh, we don't really have a market for, uh, for healthcare to some degree in Canada. So uh, starting things is a little bit more difficult, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I was able to do a few things before I did RFA, which is when I started transworld thyroidectomy, um, uh, retroperitis gopitrelectomy, rectectomy, uh, and a couple other procedures. Um, so um, so it was, I had some kind of starting point. But I think um, bringing in a new technology and starting a procedure with a new technology has its own uh, level of, uh, of difficulty. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Talk about indications that we use in Canada. Um, uh, I've tried to set our our indications quite tight because, um, especially in any new jurisdiction, uh, the referring docs and the patients will look to kind of the uh, the first people that have started doing it to see what is kind of accepted versus not accepted uh, for indications. And I think if you look uh, in the U.S. Uh, overall, there's a high variability of what people are doing certain procedures for not related to RFA, um, and, and so I thought that we, we should at least have some sort of a structured standardization of what patients should be done. Um, and this is based on data, uh, evidence-based guidelines for the most part. Um, what about cancer? Uh, in Canada, I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, our cancer approach um, and uh, some of the innovative uh, cancer approaches that we have in Toronto and how that's kind of spread across Canada to some degree. Uh, and um, talk about some of the protocols and lessons learned from, uh, from the regional first uh, uh, for RFA specifically. So just a bit of a background in Canada, and, and, and I'm giving you this information so you can apply it to your own area. I don't know if there's anyone from outside of North America here today, uh, but this, uh, this, some of this could be uh, applicable to uh, your area, especially if you're in a, a state that doesn't do a lot of uh, RFAs right now. Uh, so we have 35 million people in Canada, about the, about the size of, almost the size of uh, California. Um, healthcare is, is administered at the provincial level, so uh, it's almost like an HMO. So basically, the uh, single payer system pays uh, all hospital costs and physician costs in the province. Um, uh, new technologies, specifically if in the hospital, are sometimes funded, but that's based on the hospital specifically. So, for example, if you bring in RFA, uh, you may or may not get uh, input or funding by the hospital. And so, for us, that was the case. So, the hospital decided they were going to fund it, and then Kind of the last minute when I had it approved, they said, "Oh, we don't have the budget for it," and so we had to figure out how to find a budget for it. Um, we have 16 million people in Ontario, uh, and Ontario is the largest province in Canada. For those of you who aren't unfamiliar with Canada, um, we have about 8,000 thyroidectomies done every year in Ontario, and the majority of thyroidectomies, or at least the the thyroidectomies that are that are prioritized by hospitals, are ones that are cancer related. So specifically, RFA is a great player for a situation where cancers are. Predominantly funded, or if you are your if your healthcare region is funded um, more for cancer, not cancer, this is actually a great a great option in those scenarios. Um, uh, so uh, this was a this was a, a, a point where um, you know in 2018 I was you know obviously following closely uh, the American uh, FDA approval of uh, of the RFA device, and um, and so there was for, for, from 2018 uh, on there was a lot of uh, patients specifically that were very frustrated that technology would come in Canada. Um, so this was just one of the examples of the change.org uh, um, page that had uh, you know, over 7,500 7, signatures uh, to try to get this, this technology into Canada. 
So this was part of our, uh, our attempt to try to bring this into, into the new Canadian uh, sphere. Uh, again, this is a map of Canada. It's uh, bigger than the US uh, in terms of land mass, obviously much smaller in terms of people. And these are the, um, uh, let me just So yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is basically the, the areas, these, these are the medical schools across the country. Uh, you see there's only like one medical school in BC, it's a, a population of like three or four million people. Uh, there's two in Alberta, um, and then you can see there's a few dotted across the country. Uh, these uh, X's here are the only places that currently give RFA procedure, or have RFA procedures available for patients. Uh, there's a couple centers in Toronto that now are available. Uh, and then there's a couple centers in, um, I think, Quebec. Uh, I've trained some people from other areas of Canada that are starting to, uh, to start to, to do more of them. But as you can see, there's a, there's a very big, and, and this is to some degree exists in the US uh, outside of major uh, large uh, urban centers. Uh, we have two endocrine surgery fellowships, uh, one in Calgary, one in Toronto. And so we don't have a lot of, uh, at least, training from the residency fellowship level uh, available. So that's why this, these kinds of situations where you have Practicing physicians that want to take up this technology is really, really important, and um, and and really, uh, you know, the, the market. Uh, you know, I use I use the term loosely, but the market for patients that would benefit from RFA is so large um, when you look outside of the, the large academic population. So this is um, a bit of an overview of the practicalities of new technology. Uh, I'll just briefly go over them in case you're actually in case you're interested uh, in moving to a new country or if you're living in new, another country. Um, the uh, the health authorities of uh, of identifying new technology and approving them for use um, is highly variable across the world. Uh, the FDA, as everybody knows, is kind of the be all end all in the U.S. Uh, but there is a um, there is an organization called uh, MD Zap, which is Medical Devices Single Audit Program, which uh, came into play a few years ago. And what this is is a collection of agencies, or basically a, 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 an approval process for uh, for standardizing uh, the kind of yearly audits, uh, the application process for new technologies approval uh, in multiple countries. And so uh, the Canadian um, uh, Health Canada, which is the corollary to, to uh, FDA, um, is part of this. And as you can see, other countries like Australia, Brazil, Japan, um, and to some degree, uh, the FDA, where they use uh, auto reports for this, is, are all connected. So if you can find these kinds of things or if you can use support from these kinds of things, it's actually much more helpful. Um, and now uh, StarMed has actually had their, uh, pro their pro um, uh, product approved through the NBSAP. Um, uh, authority, so that's kind of much more helpful if you're moving to another country. Um, uh, the FDA obviously is involved with the U.S., and I won't go into the details for that uh, at this point. I, I have a, a, you know, I, I have a, a, a epidemiology um, a background, but uh, understanding how health systems improve pro uh, products and moving products through certain systems is a whole new kettle of fish. Um, as an academic uh, surgeon, uh, you know, you kind of have this kind of small view of how things work in your, uh, your jurisdiction, but this kind of stuff really is uh, is a whole new uh, a whole new job that I took on over the last few years. Uh, it's actually been great because you know the people um, uh, in um, uh, in the StarMed group, as well as uh, the distributor or organization who's actually here today, SouthMedic uh, in Canada, they've been really helpful in trying to spearhead this. On the other side, uh, and I'll talk a bit about this uh, in a second, but I'm uh, doing a trial for small overstyre cancers uh, using RFA. And so in that scenario, we need to get uh, uh, approval uh, from the uh, REB. Um, and I actually had a, 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 a simultaneous uh, application to Health Canada to introduce a new technology for research purposes. Um, and usually that's quicker, but because we applied for this in 2019, and, uh, and during COVID, Health Canada was not entertaining any new technologies that weren't related to COVID. Um, everything basically stopped it for two years. So we had basically a two year delay in this product coming to Canada. Um, but but what, I did, what I tried to do was have a, an institutional um, a research uh, application to the Health Canada approval process uh, simultaneously. Unfortunately, what happened was, uh, I think it was February or January of, of last year, where we got approval for the, um, for the REB, or for the REB approved protocol, and then like two weeks later, we got full approval for the device. So it was kind of really annoying that we, had, we, had, we did both uh, at the 
same time. But either way, it worked out. We were able to, because if you have a device approved, you can use it for our research, and a lot of the research uh, I think the board approves it. Um, uh, from the funding perspective, uh, again, like it depends on your jurisdiction. We had a long, a long discussion about private practice funding. Uh, and I think in, in hospitals a little bit differently, in American hospitals, uh, even in different states, is different than Canadian hospitals in different provinces. So I won't specifically go into that uh, of how to fund your, your project, uh, but, but in our scenario, we had some um, institutional money from donors to get this technology up and running. And I think in hospital systems, you can use, you can kind of lean on that a little bit more, um, to at least for, for startup costs. Um, for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, disposable costs, we actually um, uh, put it into the patient's hands, and uh, and sometimes they, a lot of patients in Canada do have private insurance for non-hospital uh, or non-medically um, uh, necessary we call it services. Uh, so we are leaning on those uh, those um, uh, companies to help uh, supplement some of the out-of-pocket costs. Um, and then uh, research work, I'll talk about. So these are my indications for RFA, at least in Canada. We do hot nodules, uh, specifically single hot nodules. We do large symptomatic nodules, and we do small, uh, small neoplasm, small, small thyroid cancer, test of five and six. So for our clinical indications, I won't go into this, uh, I'll go into this briefly just because this is um, something that will be discussed. But, uh, but really, you know, one of the things that you, you will find when you're starting to do this procedure and you're the first in your, in your area, your jurisdiction to do it, is that you'll get a lot of emails, a lot of texts, a lot of phone calls from many different, uh, uh, many of your colleagues uh, around, and I'm sure yeah, you're smiling, uh, saying, you know, can this patient or can I get RFA? And, uh, and you're like, okay, well, I don't know what your thyroid looks like, I don't know what your indication is. So I have really, um, uh, you know, uh, an algorithm, and I, you know, I, I, I didn't have a secretary for a while because uh, um, it was hard to hire one through the hospital, it's a long story. But I was basically doing my secretary over for a while, and I kind of figured out the best way to do this. So you'll get an email about somebody that wants to have RFA, and I think it's really important uh, to ask for the main things uh, that you need to make a decision, and pretty much all of that surrounds is surrounded by the ultrasound images. So every time I get a fax for a referral for an RFA, they send the, they send the report, and then I get the ultrasound report, and I always say I need the images, and then they send another fax for the report. Um, and I think it's really important to stress that when you have a referral for an ultrasound, uh, for an RFA, to avoid, at least for me, because I see a lot of patients from outside of my jurisdiction, so they're not just driving like 10 minutes to see me, they're coming, you know, sometimes uh, hours and even days on the plane to come see me. Uh, I usually will get a, uh, an ultrasound uh, sent either by uh, email or by um, by CD. A lot of uh, you know, Canada, a lot of people still use CD. They burn out a CD, they send it, and so I have to find the computer in the hospital that has a CD uh, slit to, to use. But but basically, you really want to review that ultrasound to see if they meet criteria. And I think that's like the most important. Uh, obviously, we can do a hot nodule uh, just here. Um, what I'll, I'll ask for is the uptake images, the thyroid uptake images. It's not enough for me, again, to have the report. I need the uptake images um, so I can correlate that ultrasound from, the, from the, the nodule from the ultrasound to the nodule from the uptake image, and then uh, to make sure they don't have graves, I get a, I get a thyroid center in the From a symptomatic nodule perspective, I usually recommend two benign biopsies. This is kind of part of our protocol. Um, I usually will have one benign biopsy low-risk lesion, um, you know, if it's a purely low-risk, like a very low-risk lesion, uh, and obviously they, they've probably had multiple biopsies in the past that were uh, non-diagnostic, I'll usually just, uh, just uh, you know, I, I do all my own ultrasounds anyway, so I'll usually say, you know, we'll talk about the risks and benefits of this. I mean, I, I, I'm less dogmatic in our practice, we don't have the same medical legal issues in Canada that we do in the U.S., uh, but I think, uh, depending on your jurisdiction, if you do, if you are in an area with less medical legal issues, you can potentially you know, not be as dogmatic, and, and more people that would benefit would actually uh, be able to get, get our <coughs> um, And then, uh, and the other thing is I ensure symptoms. So a two or three centimeter thyroid nodule uh, that's benign, that's not causing any symptoms, that's in the thyroid, uh, I will say no uh, to RFA. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of, at least for my, um, in my jurisdiction, it's really important because uh, what happens is people will get ultrasound, especially we have now, you know, the Cleveland Clinic has set up a primary care a spot in Toronto uh, where they uh, charge uh, patients uh, to be a member of the Cleveland Clinic uh, primary care situation, and they go in, they get these screening ultrasounds, they see that your thyroid nodule, you all worry they want to, what they want to RFA. And I think in my practice, at least, I've kind of shied away from doing those, those nodules, um, but but uh, so that's kind of what, what our standard is here. But every every jurisdiction uh, is different, as we mentioned. Um, and then. Um, and then the other thing is pre-plan a stage procedure. So if you're going to have a very massive thyroid nodule, um, I'll usually talk them up front. Well, this nodule is very, 
very big. Um, you know, the, these are often patients that have been with years and years with our nodules that are massive. You can see them propagating on the neck. You don't want a surgery under any circumstances. They've been waiting for RFA for years. Finally, they come and say, okay, you know, do my RFA fix my neck? And, and I'll say, you know, this is not going to be possible with one RFA. Uh, also, when there's a, a small substrate component, component, oftentimes they'll do the RFA on that side, and then they'll shrink, and then the bottom uh, substrate component will come up, and we can do it again, uh, again later. And usually schedule that. We can talk about that. I'm sure, I think there's a talk about this, about timing for that, but usually, you know, the data is about, you know, at least nine months to a year of, of, um, of uh, review, and then, uh, then we'll do that again. So I have someone coming up, actually, for one of those. Uh, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of exclusions, uh, you know, indeterminate nodules, so, uh, you know, big nodules that are, that are big, uh, symptomatic, but indeterminate, I won't do those. Um, uh, and then nodules which are not symptomatic, we talked about, and then single hot uh, nodules, I do, but if there's multiple foci of nodules, especially bilateral. So I always put this picture up, uh, but everybody that does RFA for hot nodules will know that this is probably not a good patient to do uh, for, for RFA. So I think that's kind of really important. Like we almost, you know, as a, I'm a surgeon, but I, uh, you know, I, I, I work a lot, of, I'm across the point in the endocrinology division, so I kind of feel like I'm an endocrinologist. I actually wanted to be an endocrinologist when I started med school, but I wasn't cool enough, um, so we became a surgeon. But I think it's really, it's really kind of this thing where you really have to have this, uh, this, this diagnostic mindset first, um, and that's kind of probably the most important part, is if you don't have a good diagnosis before the procedure, then your outcome's not gonna be good, because you, you, won't, you won't be able to fix something. Like you won't be able to do to approach something that, that is a problem. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about this because I think I'm uh, somewhat a, a little bit more aggressive in, in, in the de-escalation of thyroid cancer care uh, in, in Canada. Um, we have a, a large active surveillance study that started in Toronto by Anna Saka. Many of you know she's the editor in chief of, uh, of thyroid. Uh, she's one of the uh, endocrinologists that works with me, and um, and she started. Uh, uh, Part of, the, part of her, pro, her program, but her, she started this, this program about 10 years ago uh, to do active surveillance for thyroid cancers to, uh, less than two centimeters in size, and she's publishing now some of the uh, you know, 8 to 10 year data. And, um, and so thyroid, uh, thyroid cancer surveillance is a very effective method for patients that have very low risk thyroid cancers. We have good data from this, uh, specifically from PKMCs uh, in Japan, uh, from the early Mayuchi data, which has been followed up for many decades. Um, and then now from this North American, North American study, there's a cohort, um, you know, some of the, even the people in this room are running active surveillance cohorts as well. Um, and, and, and I think that this is something that, that, uh, that I was able, that I, being involved with this and now being involved with RFA, I, I kind of uh, was able to kind of bring these things together um, with large discussions amongst our groups. And the way that, I'm, the way that I think about this is, is the following. So if you have a, a thyroid uh, cancer um, guideline that published 2009 saying that total thyroidectomy uh, is, is ideal for th small thyroid cancers. And then in 2015, you have a guideline that says we can consider active surveillance. You have a huge change in the management strategies for thyroid cancers. And I think whether that's evidence-based or not, it becomes difficult for both the patients and the providers to see that switch so quickly in such a few amount of years. And this is uh, echoed in some of the data, specifically from the EDO trials, from uh, Meucci's uh, trials in, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, COVID Japan, where he showed that younger patients actually fall out of active surveillance trials, not because they have progression, but because they just worried about this, this thyroid cancer the neck for many years. And we see that in Toronto. We see that young patients actually don't do as well in active surveillance. So I think this is exactly where RFA, I think, comes into and I think that patients that have a small thyroid cancer in their neck, that probably won't affect them. Uh, you know, the data is uh, pretty clear that, you know, uh, <coughs> show that only a couple percent of patients have progression, specific progression, metastatic met met disease, those kinds of things. Then we can really uh, understand that it, it's about doing something to those nodules, and, uh, and I'll talk about what that, what that actually is. So, so I think this is where this comes from. From active surveillance, I think the R phase kind of meets in the middle. Um, you know, we know that these are the, the low risk, uh, just the, from the 2015 ATU guideline, uh, we know that low risk thyroid cancers have less than 5% uh, 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 persistence rates. And so it doesn't matter if you do total thyroidectomy, rate of iodine, low bactomy, active surveillance, if you pick the right patient, they're all going to do fairly similar. Um, and, and I talked to, talk to the patients about this, you know, we have data that shows that, you know, low bactomy, total thyroidectomy, and active surveillance, if you look at some of the data that specifically look at those specific patient uh, characteristics. They have the same outcome, so why would you do more uh, more advanced uh, uh, 
more aggressive on that procedure. Now, I know that's very easy to say from an ivory tower in Toronto and you in University of Toronto, and the practical aspects of you know, referring doctors and those kinds of things, uh, you know, the, the expectations of patients, expectations of the jurisdictional you know, referring doctors are a certain way. But I think if you, if you understand you know, the, the, the morbidity and the, and, and the, the implications of doing you know, more advanced uh, surgical management, I think RFA is, a, is an ideal, uh, an ideal uh, scenario for a small lower center cancer, both from a practical perspective and the patient having something done, and also from an oncologic outcome. I mean, it can't be worse than active surveillance, right? Like that's a thing from an oncologic perspective. So, uh, so this is like, uh, this is just a little bit of our trial. This is an operational trial. Uh, that we're doing uh, for Bethesda 5 and 6, two centimeters or less. Um, and, uh, and this is what kind of, these are the kinds of patients, this is one of the patients we did last week or the week before. Um, and so this is kind of, uh, this is the thyroid cancer here, you can see, um, this is just our, um, uh, so I use, I, I use, I'm very liberal. So these are highly technical procedures. Um, you know, from a, if you have a large thyroid nodule that you're just ablating with a one centimeter tip, and you know, even if you get most of it, uh, it's gonna shrink. I think when you do a thyroid cancer, uh, these are highly technical. You have to use, I have a D5, I can show you, my, I don't think I put it on the slide, but I can show you my setup. I have a D5 uh, normal saline um, uh, uh, tip in, uh, usually like around the uh, tracheal side of the nodule, and I'm, I'm inserting the, the D5 at the same time as the probe is, uh, the, the RFA probe is in as well. Um, so I do this for high section. So I have like a bit of a setup situation. They're highly technical, they're very fun. Um, as a surgeon, I love doing these. Uh, but, but really, uh, the, the, the data is so good, like some of the Chinese uh, data sets from 10 to 15 years shows that about 90 to 95% of these nodules are actually completely disappeared. Um, that's what we're seeing as well. I've been doing this for about a year and a half. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty good, um, it's pretty good, uh, uh, good outcomes. Uh, the exclusion criteria is pretty minimal. Advanced disease, so any uh, locally advanced uh, uh, lesions, um, I base it off of really the, the uh, active surveillance trial. So if you don't meet criteria for active surveillance, you don't meet criteria for this. Um, and um, and really, uh, you know, I don't. I, I I'm able to you know hyper dissect enough away from the critical structures that you can get through the entire module. Um, uh, people talk about you know margins. I think that that's you know that's a whole other talk. But I think you know with with a good uh, highly technical experience, you can you can do these pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so how to find patients in a, uh, in a, at least in an academic practice. I think this really relies on the attitudes of the people involved in the pathway of thyroid nodules. And when I say the pathway of thyroid nodules, that includes obviously the physician that's performing the RFA, but I think more importantly, it's that patient and the referring doctor are on board with what you're doing. Um, it's, it's something to say that you're doing these thyroid nodule ablations for big symptomatic thyroid nodules, which is we talked about is probably the majority of patients that you're gonna have. But the, it's another thing to say that, that the majority of the referring doctors in your area are gonna either understand or believe that this is an important and effective procedure. And I think that is where, at least in my small jurisdiction, uh, was the most uh, difficult and still is a difficult thing to get to. Um, you know, I, I give talks uh, to the Canadian Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Uh, I give talks to the local endocrinologists, to the family docs. I did a talk to the Ontario Family Medicine Association. And, and just, uh, you know, the, the, the understanding of how the treatment of thyroid nodules has changed dramatically over the last five to 10 to 15 years, not even including RFA, um, is something that is difficult to kind of change the needle. And I think the more people that perform this procedure, that's why I'm very liberal in trying to get as many people as possible to do this procedure. Because the more people that can perform this procedure, it's not gonna be taken away from, from my practice because the more people that are doing it, the more referring doctors will learn about it, the more people will have it done. And I think that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the mentality that I have at least in, in, uh, in Canada. And I think it, especially in many jurisdictions in the US it applies. I train in the US so I kind of have a little bit of, uh, of an understanding of how the system works. Um, and I've kind of tried to use a lot of that, uh, a lot of those lessons in Canada. Uh, social media, obviously, we talked, uh, we talked uh, briefly uh, before about social media and websites. Um, you know, I got my medical student think my website is really crappy, um, so I have to kind of uh, get it, get it better. I mean, the, you know, the academic websites are traditionally really poor compared to the private practice websites. Um, uh, education and referring docs. I think this is where it comes into play. This is the most probably the most important. Uh, part of it, because if you can't get the thyroidologist on board, really it's hard to get uh, hard, hard, hard to get people on board. 
Um, setting it up in uh, the actual procedure, and I'll talk about that in a second, but really the inter interdisciplinary work and getting, <coughs> getting it assessed and getting it done is really important. So who's gonna be assisting? I mean, I don't have somebody to press the button to turn it on and off in my, um, in my uh, uh, clinic, so I just use the foot pedal. And you know, it's about how, who's gonna be around to do it. Um, and and uh, I like to probably use it for cautery and the OR and stuff, so I don't know if it's mine for, you know, sometimes I use it for certain things. Um, and I think it's really, uh, it's really kind of depending on how, who you have to help you. Um, insert, ensure that you're familiar with all the processes, so like, you know, Especially like we have relatively scant nursing in my clinic, so I'm like, you know, sometimes turning over the room, um, you know, all uh, all all set up the device, uh, you know, so I know I know how to have the device set up. It's pretty easy to set up, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, if you can do the procedure, you can certainly set it up. So I think uh, I think you know learning how to set it up and those kinds of things is really important and helpful. Uh, this is actually one of this is our first case that we did last year, uh, early last year, um, and um, I sat down for that case, but since then I have not sat down. <laughs> Um, I was talking before when we did the practical part of it that really the ergonomics are really important, especially doing those massive goggles that are like really large, um, super, uh, super, um, uh, you know, <coughs> fungi on you know, the neck, big. You know, I did a nine centimeter dodge yesterday. And that's, your back starts hurting, your, your, your foot starts hurting because you're pushing the pedal, and you're holding your foot over the pedal and waiting for it to push it again to stop and start. So I think it's really important to kind of have an ergonomically, uh, uh, at least reasonable position when you're doing it. Um, this is a video uh, one of my master students decided to make of like just kind of how our process works. So this is the Toronto General Hospital uh, in Toronto downtown. You're all welcome to come anytime. Just send me an email. I'd love to have everybody come and see what we do. Um, but uh, basically, we have three steps: of the room preparation, with patient arrival, check-in, and then patient preparation. Sorry, four steps, and then our fit procedure. Um, maybe there might be five. Okay, five. Uh, patient recovery, discharge. Um, and so the room preparation, uh, basically to set the room up, and I have some pictures. So this is my clinic room. It's like not that big. Uh, it's probably like maybe 50 to 30 square feet. Um, this is the, uh, the room in the back. We have all of our stuff. Um, we put it on chairs. Like it's not, it's not a very uh, high-end uh, kind of setup. Um, uh, this is our, uh, our device. This is, our, uh, this is how we kind of uh, get it through. Uh, patient check-in, so they come into the board. I, I, I also use the, uh, the quo technique, which is the 0.5 milligrams of lorazepam uh, when they come in, and then another five milligram, <coughs> about half milligram tab of something like little uh, lorazepam when they uh, go into the uh, procedure room. Um, so I think that's very, very helpful, and uh, that makes them uh, at least tolerate it, uh, especially when they're anxious. So this is the, um, this is the setup. So we have the ground pads on, um, I always talk to them about the whole procedure before they start, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows that as well. Uh, we set it up uh, for the procedure. Uh, again, I have here, um, I think it's uh, Ryan, one of the StarMed guys uh, here, or sorry, stuff medic guys here, and, um, uh, and here's uh, one of our nurses helping. Uh, so then, once we start, usually everyone disappears out of the room. <laughs> uh, so it's basically me. Sometimes I have a fellow, uh, if they are interested in coming uh, for that day. Um, but we kind of are uh, set up. Then I, I usually will put the, um, the local in. I use half lupificate, half lidocaine. Uh, that's also the quote technique. And uh, Jen Poe said she's sitting in the back. And we basically, uh, we basically drape the patient. Again, it's, it's not overly sterile, um, but it is clean. Uh, we use our hyperdissection. Uh, at the same time, we do the RFA procedure. I won't go into the specifics about those. And then, uh, and then we uh, put them into the room. I'll usually, um, I'll usually uh, get them into the, uh, the uh, holding room and then put a nice pack on them uh, and then uh, set up the next patient and right before starting the next case, I'll go back and say hi to them and discharge them uh, after about 10 minutes from the procedure. So, uh, so it's, pretty, um, uh, it's a pretty quick procedure. I usually do uh, four in a day. I start like 9.30 and I finish like 1.30. Then I have a clinic across the street at Princess Margaret. So, uh, so I kind of uh, I kind of have that um, that as my protocol. Um, some of the this is I'll, have a, I'll end with a couple of slides just about some of the kind of insights that I've uh, that I picked up over we're doing it for the last year and a half. Um, patients come with a lot of questions and a lot of questions about the data. So I think the talk we had about you know the guidelines is really important. Um, they're going to come with like you know especially the ones that have been waiting for this for a long time to come to your jurisdiction. They're going to come with like pages and pages of printouts from the internet from certain websites. 
Um, so I think it's really important to at least scan the websites to know like <coughs> what's out there. Um, uh, some of the data that's uh, that exists on RFA is really important to know. Um, we have, I was saying before to our, our small group, we have a, I set up a rounds, uh, so I have a, a, an academic rounds for our endocrine surgery group, and I set up a, like a, a dedicated rounds, uh, usually once a month or more about uh, tough cases. So if you have like a thyroid, uh, a big thyroid nodule where there's weird anatomy or the indications are a little bit unclear, I think it's really important to have a consensus like we do for cancers. Um, and then that also helps with uh, potentially with medical legal issues or other stuff if you have a consensus state to have a consensus discussion about a specific case. Um, be prepared. Uh, obviously, no surgeons have complications, but, um, but I think uh, you know, if, you, if you do a lot of uh, procedures, you're going to have complications. And I think having, um, having a, 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 you know, a, a, a group uh, of people that you know that are also doing it um, uh, can help you kind of through them, and uh, both from a, a practical perspective, but also from like an emotional perspective. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, as I said, like, I have some experience with this because I've, uh, I've started some, uh, not with the complications obviously, uh, but some experience with this, um, I think, uh, some experience with this from other procedures that I've done uh, that I was talking about. So it's, you know, you always have new things that pop up, not necessarily complications, but things that like patients questions will ask and those kinds of things. So it's important to have like a, a good group of people that you can talk to. I think it's important if you're going to start something new to have a good QI program. You know, speaking as like an ivory tower guy, I, I think that's you know everything you do, you should have good documentation and re regular review of them. So we have like at least every couple months, we have a QI review of all our all of our cases that we've done, how we can improve, uh, you know, both from a practical perspective and also an indication perspective, and then timing and clinic. So what what um, how long should it take you to do them? When should you start uh, in the morning? And uh, when should you uh, when should you stop? And, and you know how long. How's long the buffer? Should you assign different times for different types of cases? Like for example, my thyroid cancer case might be a bit shorter than like the, you know the nine centimeter thyroid nodules. So in conclusion, uh, number one, uh, ensure the equipment and supplies available and reliable in your location. And I think this is different than in uh, than in a private practice because you have to kind of generate uh, a buy-in from many different layers of the uh, academic and hospital bureaucracy. Uh, have clear indications for your RFA in your practice, so you don't really want to be making new indications on the fly. You want to be like, okay, this is a patient, does it meet cr criteria in my mind for an indication for the procedure? Yes, no, if not, you know, maybe it meet criteria for surgery, maybe you should send you a surgeon, or if you're going to be a sur your surgeon, you, you can do the operation. Um, uh, or they may need nothing, uh, and that's a lot of my patients that I see in the clinic that need nothing. Um, have, uh, uh, like, pick straight, pick straight forward motivated patients first. I think it was, there was nothing better than having like patients that are so keen, so excited uh, to do the first few cases because then you know you're feeling good about them, the patients are feeling good about them, and uh, and you just roll roll with it for the first few at uh, first at least the first couple months you want to have good even if it means that you're only doing like one case every week or so I think it's really important to kind of have uh, kind of have a lot of uh, a lot of good motivated patients first and then be prepared for unexpected issues as I mentioned before like complications or not even complications but questions. Uh, you know, patients may call and say, well, is this normal, is that normal? Um, uh, and uh, and um, uh, really kind of understand what, what you're, uh, what, that you're, gonna, you're not gonna know what you, what you don't know initially, but it's gonna, it's gonna come once you uh, get any volume, any type of volume. Um, and obviously, good luck, you guys are gonna do great. And uh, call me, if, email me if you have any questions, because I've been through all of it uh, myself, so I'm happy to you know, talk to you. Yeah, we have uh, we banked all of the uh, all of the, uh, uh, the biopsy uh, tissue or cytology, and we do have uh, we are ha we do have a um, a plan for uh, there's a company in Canada that actually does uh, a gene expression classifier as well as genetic or, uh, DNA uh, analysis of these nodules as well. So we're gonna use our outcomes and then correlate them as well with the uh, with those uh, molecular uh, signature for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Couple questions. So, in your criteria, or any anybody else can comment, please. Uh, what about growing nodules? So, I have patients that they come in and every time they are like 30% growth, 30% growth, and it's not symptomatic. Would that be a case that RFA might be helpful? I mean, I think when, it, when that's the thing when I tell people, like you know, they always ask, "What's the chance of it regrowing?" And I think one of the things is to say, you know, if you do an RFA on somebody and it grows. 
um, uh, then you may have to rethink your diagnosis. That's the first, th the first point I'll say about that. The second thing I'll say is that you're saying that this is a, a non, an asymptomatic nodule, but it is growing. Uh -huh. I think in that scenario, what's the reason for RFA? And if the reason for RFA is to stop it from becoming symptomatic, I mean, I don't think, at least personally, I don't think that that's necessarily something to do a preemptive uh, RFA for. Um, in my practice, I also see nodules that are growing that may have been benign, but they look kind of very the follicular pattern and stuff on ultrasound that we always have to worry about. There's a couple, you know, everyone has the stories of those patients that are like, you know, we should do diagnostic uh, partial thyroidectomy and it comes back as a follicular thyroid cancer with angiovasia, those kinds of things. So I think, I think it's really important for the diagnostic side to say, okay, what is the reason for doing this? Are we concerned that it's growing? It's been benign on biopsy and it's still growing and it looks kind of I mean, if it looks like a spongiform nodule and it's just increasing cystic component, then who cares? Like, it's going to grow, it's going to shrink, it's going to grow, it's going to shrink. But I think uh, the, those follicular lesions that are growing, um, I think it's important to kind of have a bit of a, a bit of a, a thought about like what is your diagnosis here, and should it be doing something other than our potentially? What about a family history of thyroid cancer and nodule a patient that's very worried about it? Uh, you know, we have a lot of data for non-medullary fam familial, non-medullary uh, familial palpable thyroid cancer, uh, and the screening guidelines uh, show that even if you have two first degree relatives, you probably shouldn't offer sound patients. Um, I think that this is a discussion you have with your patient and your referring doc, and decide you know what is the goal of, of treating this patient. Um, and I think that in those scenarios, you may want to do uh, surgery, <coughs> diagnostic surgery, or you may do RFA potentially. Uh, but, but in my practice, I've kind of shied away from those cases um, in a preemptive manner. Uh, I've done mostly for the clear indication of symptomatic patients or potentially hot nodules as, as clinical indications for that, for our event. And in, 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 sorry, yeah. last one. In, 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 in the terminal nodule that you yes. excluded, what if you do it in a firma is saying, I actually have a yeah. patient that two affirmas were negative, yeah. both of them AUS, both yeah. of them are firma negative. Yeah, firma is firma negative is, is negative. So That's, then you would consider that. Yeah, yeah, fir, firma negative. I mean, we we in Canada again, we don't have ac readily ready access to a firma or thyroid conversion three. We don't have ready access to that. So we have some patients that get it, and some patients that have a, a, a B three B four and they go for firma and it's negative. That's 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 completely reasonable. That's like a three percent chance of thyroid cancer. That's completely reasonable. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, comparing the, the active surveillance to the RFA, what I know that if the nodule is very anterior or posterior, you know, active surveillance might be not very advisable. How about the RFA? Like the one that was ablated, you feel like, you know, it's very close to the strap muscle. Is there a concern that it might, when it grows, it might invade the strap muscle? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. So we initially had worried, and, and even uh, Mayuchi's data has had, had excluded patients in the trachosophic groove. Um, you know, we've been a little bit less, uh, at least in our active surveillance program, we've been a little bit less uh, aggressive in, in excluding those patients uh, because, you know, we haven't had, at least there's no, not, uh, that I'm aware of reports of patients that have had small thyroid cancer in those areas and that have invaded into the, uh, into the uh, during active surveillance trial, invaded into the, uh, into the nerve. Um, I think it, it matters of how you think you can actually ablate it. So if you actually see an invasion of the strap muscle, that's, that's locally advanced thyroid cancer. That's not, uh, that's not appropriate for, for our thing. Um, but sometimes they're very anterior, and you can see a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, muscular, um, uh, a nice muscular margin. And the other thing is that when you do your, uh, your, um, uh, your uh, local uh, for, the, for the thyroid capsule, so, you, so the, the way that we do the, our thyroid capsule block, we actually put the local in that, that plane, and you see the muscles separate so well from that thyroid nodule. And if that muscle separates well, you know that it separates well. If you're having trouble in that scenario, um, then that would be a, another real indication that this is probably something that should come out. Um, so I think it's, it's really, uh, you know, sometimes it can be affected by biopsy. You get a biopsy in that, those anterior nodules, and you get like a little bit of hematoma in that area, causes fibrosis. We know that in surgery. Sometimes, you know, we think it's a locally advanced thyroid cancer, we say it in our nose, but really it's a low risk. Uh, middle invasive flick, flick of thyroid, flicker uh, area of thyroid can uh, happen that cancer. So I think it, it really depends on the kind of the clinical in, uh, situation at that time. But certainly if you have an advanced, uh, look advanced thyroid cancer to the strap muscle, that's not a mutation in surveillance, that'd be a surgical.